Chapter 19 talks about the evolution of population. Evolution, while obvious to scientists now, was a tough pill to swallow when it was first introduced. Ideas about inheritance were centered around the blending concept, the idea that a child was an exact blend of their parents rather than a collection of traits from both. Once we understood genetics better, Mendel's theories became clear and were more widely read by people like Darwin and Wallace, those, understand, those working on evolution began to understand the mechanisms a little bit more clearly. The modern synthesis began. Modern synthesis blended current knowledge with evolutionary theory, which it turns out flow together perfectly. One supports the other better than scientists could have hoped. When we study population genetics, looking at how selective forces change a population through changes in allele and genotype frequencies. Allelic frequencies are measured rates at which specific alleles appear in a population. So we actually count how many homozygous dominant traits the population has or how many homozygous recessive traits it has. These frequencies can change for various reasons. Mutation, sexual reproduction, and natural selection are the big three. As we count allelic frequencies, we consider the entire gene pool or the sum of all the alleles in a population. This is an example of something known as the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or an equation that can show us an allele frequency and how it might change over time. In this example, we're looking at a population of 500 peas. They each have two alleles for color for a total of 1,000 alleles. When we go through and count out the alleles, we find 245 homozygous dominant individuals. If you count their individual alleles, they have 490 big Ys between them. There are 210 heterozygous individuals. They have one big Y and one little Y each. The homozygous recessive individuals, of which there are 45, therefore carry 90 little Ys between them. If you add up all of these totals, that was 490 plus 210 for a total of 700 big Ys, and, and 210 plus 90 for a total of 100 little y's, you can calculate the allelic frequencies. Our total population is 70% big y and only 30% little. As frequencies, we would say 0.7 and 0.3 respectively. We use the variable p to talk about the homozygous dominant allele and the variable q to talk about the homozygous recessive allele in terms of the Hardy-Weinberg equation. That's just how they chose to write it when they came up with this equation. When populations are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the allelic frequency is stable from generation to generation, and their distribution of alleles can be determined using something called the Hardy-Weinberg equation. If the allele frequencies that are measured actually differ from these predicted values after a few generations, scientists can then make inferences about what evolutionary forces are in play and what the population might look like a few generations from now. Here's what the Hardy-Weinberg equation and potential analysis look like. We can cross our given population. You see it here written as a Punnett square and we can see our potential outcomes of predicted frequencies of offspring. The equation written by Hardy and Weinberg is as follows. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared all equal 1 when you write out the numbers or percentages as frequencies. P squared gives you the predicted number of YY offspring. 2PQ gives you the predicted number of big Y, little y offspring. And the predicted frequency of little y, little y, that's your Q squared. This might seem a little abstract, but it allows us to put numbers to specific populations and see and actually quantify if they're changing over time. But the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium sits within a very particular set of rules. For their equation, all organisms must be diploid, only sexual reproduction can occur, the mating has to be absolutely random, and the population size needs to be infinitely large. Allele frequencies have to be equal in both sexes, and there can't be any mutation, migration, or natural selection occurring. You might be thinking, well, when does that happen? And the answer is never outside of the lab. 
but it's just kind of a helpful way to theoretically look at evolution or maybe even practice it in your own laboratory if you can get an infinitely large population. But it's nice because it allows us to simply quantify some of these ideas and put them down on paper. When we actually study population genetics, we look a lot at variability. Individuals in a population show a measure of variability. That variability is affected by natural selection and the various methods previously mentioned. Not all traits can be inherited from your parents. Some are built over a lifetime. Just because your dad is good at running, it doesn't mean you will be. Heritability is the fraction of phenotype variation that can actually be attributed to genetic differences. Maintaining genetic variation in a population keeps the population healthy by diluting any potential negative, negative alleles. Interbreeding can actually increase the frequency of those negative alleles, and we refer to problems caused by interbreeding as interbreeding depression. Interbreeding species have a whole host of medical issues and could be a topic for an entire class. Thankfully, most populations have enough community members that they're not pushed to interbreeding. Genetic drift can impact the genetics of a population by pure chance. Maybe the strongest bunny in a family group got hit by a bust or the skinniest fish only wasn't dinner because he was able to swim between a shark's teeth prior to being digested. The next few slides can show you how genetic drift can impact a population over time. It's even greater in this example because the population is small. Almost all effects that work on a gene pool are amplified when the population is small. So in this example of our very first generation of bunnies, if we count up the alleles, we see that the big B is actually equal to the little b. However, because of genetic drift, random chance, only those top five bunnies are capable of reproducing to make the second generation. Those top five bunnies have reproduced to make these 10. If you count the alleles, you'll see the p-value has changed to 0.7 and the q to only 0.3. These two red circled bunnies are able to reproduce, and you end up with this, a third generation that's already shifted to P equals 1 and Q equals 0. Random chance, the brown bunnies didn't necessarily have a great advantage, they were just able to survive in some tough times, created an entire population of bunnies that no longer carry that white allele. Genetic drift can move to change a population very quickly, even if the changes aren't necessarily adaptive. Genetic drift can be magnified by events that even have nothing to do with natural selection. For instance, maybe a volcano erupts and the bugs who are eating on a leaf just a little bit farther away from home survived while those nearer to home didn't. That population will be fundamentally changed because maybe only red bugs were eating on a further leaf that day. The whole population shifted and it has nothing to do with a natural advantage, just being at the right place in the right time. An easy way to look at this effect, which is called the bottleneck effect, is to actually look at a bottle. We had an original population of bugs, and they all fit in the bottle, and they were all perfectly fine. But when a bottleneck event occurred, and the bottle gets flipped over for just a few seconds, the marbles that just so happened to escape the neck are the only marbles to survive. While there are a lot of green and a lot of red marbles in that bottle, pink ones got out by random chance. So the new population is going to look quite different. That's genetic drift and specifically the bottleneck event. It doesn't have to all be doom and gloom when it comes to genetic drift. There's a second process called the founder effect in which only a few individuals actually choose to leave a population. Maybe they're moving to a new area or even a new continent to escape, say, religious persecution like the original colonists of the United States did. They've taken a small portion of their population and moved really far away. That population's frequency of alleles has now drastically changed simply because they're isolated. They're going to evolve quite differently than their original population that might have stayed behind in, say, the Netherlands. That's the founder effect. Gene flow is another important factor impacting evolution. Flow is, called, is caused by the migration or movement of gametes into a physically new space. 
Rather than a whole population moving, say maybe one brown bug decides to join a family of green bugs. That green bug potential gene pool now looks very different and not necessarily adaptive. That bug just got moved. Mutations can also change evolutionary paths, as can non-random mating. Non-random mating, like choosing to mate with someone because they have a very specific characteristic, can push evolutionary traits in particular directions rather quickly. There are even some environmental variances that can be tied to evolutionary traits. I'm not talking about things like tanning. I'm referring to maybe alligators, like this little guy. The sex of an American alligator is actually determined by the temperature at which the eggs are incubated. If eggs are incubated at 30 degrees, all of them will grow into females. If eggs are incubated just a little bit warmer, 33 degrees Celsius, the eggs will become male. Another common variance that can change the phenotype frequencies in a population is something called cline. A species can actually look different depending on where it lives. For instance, a particular type of mammal is actually going to look a little bit different if it lives closer to the equator than it does to the poles. Mammals closer to the equator are actually going to be a little bit smaller so they can control their temperature more effectively. There are a lot of potential variations on body plan and allelic frequencies. Adaptive evolution is kind of the brand of change that we're used to seeing. In adaptive evolution, traits can be selected either for or against. Adaptive evolution selects individuals that can make greater contributions to the gene pool for the next generation. Making these contributions are known as your evolutionary fitness, and it's actually quantified by scientists. Individuals have a relative fitness on a scale from zero, being not at all fit, not producing any viable offspring, to one, producing the maximum amount of viable offspring that you can. Adaptive evolution, leading more fit individuals to make greater concentrations to the gene pool, can have three really big impacts on a population. It can stabilize it, it can push it in a certain direction, or it can diversify it. In stabilizing selection, a population moves away from two extremes towards a happy medium. So a robin, for example, typically lays four eggs. This is an example of stabilizing selection. If you have more than four eggs, you may end up with malnourished chicks as it's hard to feed a lot of them, while if you only have one or two eggs, you might actually end up with no viable offspring at all. It's better to shoot for the middle. In directional selection, a whole population shifts its averages towards the right or the left. Here's an example. Light-colored peppered moths are better camouflaged in a pristine environment with nice, clean trees. Likewise, dark-colored pepper moths are better, are better camouflaged against a sooty environment. Thus, as the Industrial Revolution progressed in 19th century England, the color of the moth population shifted completely from light to dark. This is an example of directional selection. As England cleaned up its environment, the population shifted back. The trees and the buildings were clean again, and it was easier for light moths to hide, so the population shifted from dark to light. Here's the third type of selection, diversifying selection. This is a hypothetical population of rabbits. Some were gray, some were white, and some were Himalayan, which is just another way of saying white and gray. What these rabbits found, though, is that living in a selected pressure environment with many rocks, the white rabbits weren't easily able to hide, so diversing, diversifying selection happened. The gray rabbits and the Himalayan rabbits were able to survive and their population numbers increased, while the white rabbit population decreased considerably. These two separate little bell curves we have now may actually end up becoming different species if given enough time. Sexual dimorphism? is another potential outcome of natural selection, and it's observed in various animals. It's when males and females of the same species look quite different. The males are usually flashier and can be easily seen with big tails or large horns or bright colors. It makes them easier for predators to see, but it also makes them an ideal and attractive mate as they catch the eye. This idea is known as the handicap principle. 
The good genes hypothesis states that males that are able to develop these impressive ornaments show off their efficient metabolism and their ability to fight disease and potential predators. The females choose the mates with the most impressive traits because it signals that they probably have some form of genetic superiority. They can pass that on to their offspring. It's important to remember as we consider all of these potential changes to the gene pool, not all evolution is adaptive. There's no such thing as a perfect organism. While natural selection can choose for the fittest individuals and can result in a healthier population overall, there are a lot of potential evolutionary forces that act relatively randomly. Genetic drift and gene flow can, and can introduce deleterious effects to a population's gene pool. Evolution does not have a purpose, and it's not pushing any organism or individual to a preconceived ideal. Evolution is simply the sum of a lot of different factors coming together to influence genetic and phenotypic variants in a given population. Here ends chapter 19. Please read the chapter, take notes in your own words, do some practice problems, do some more practice problems, and take a crack at your homework.